Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the AI for Good Global Summit. My name is Bastian Kwas from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and it's my privilege to introduce today's webinar, Adversarially Non-Robust Machine Learning, by Nicholas Carlini from uh, Google AI, as part of the new Trustworthy AI series hosted by Wojciech Samek, head of the AI department at Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, and it is also the organizer of the AI for Good Global Summit, together with 38 sister UN agencies, ACM, and Cocovin with Switzerland. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to our host, Wojciech Samek. Hi, Wojciech, how are you? Hi. So also a warm welcome from my side. I'm very happy to start the workshop series on trustworthy AI today. Trustworthiness is a key requirement for bringing machine learning and the AI to real world applications. And although today's neural networks and deep learning models can do great things, we all know that in many cases they lack robustness. And our speaker today, Nicolas Kalini, is probably the one in the world who knows this best. He is a research scientist from Google AI and one of the leading experts in adversarial attacks on neural networks. Actually, some while ago, I wanted to work on the field on uh, defense methods for adversarial attacks. And many colleagues told me, don't do this. It's not worth the effort because Nicola will break it anyways. So I'm very much look forward to his view on robustness of machine learning and his solutions for how can we improve it in the future. So welcome, Nicola. I'm very happy to have you here today. And uh, yeah, we all look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for, for this nice introduction. Um, hopefully, I'll have something positive to say. Uh, most of my talk, unfortunately, is a little bit on the negative side with um, with lots of attack results, but I don't know. That's the thing that I find fun. So let me just um, start by saying that, yeah, this is going to be talking about um, adversarial robustness in machine learning and focusing mainly on the non-robust side of things. Uh, so I do research at Google, and uh, what I focus on is trying to think about the security problems of machine learning. So I think we all know that machine learning models are being used in incredibly like important situations, um, and they're doing really well in these tasks. So we can now generate text more or less as well as humans. There's speech recognition that works um, reasonably well. There's translation models that like are being deployed to help people talk across language barriers. Um, and probably the, the area where machine learning is known to work best is image classification. Um, there was this ImageNet challenge, you know, 10, 10 years ago now. And this is really what, what made deep learning actually, people believe that it would, would work. And the like overall setup here is just give it an image. You want to classify the image and say what the image is. And it sort of works sufficiently well. And it's it had made a big enough impact that like the like economic report of the president in the United States um, last year actually put like the standard image net figure that everyone shows of like the human baseline and image net accuracy over time and like calls attention to this this fact and so the question is like this is what everyone likes to think is that you have these these machine learning models that are now according to this you know better than humans but like what actually happens if you were to deploy one of these things in the real world and some adversary were to be present um, and if you were to do that, um, then you would have surprising consequences. Uh, so for example, suppose that I have this image that all of us recognize correctly as a tabby cat. And you know, a state-of-the-art neural network definitely does also recognize this with 88% confidence as the label tabby cat. Um, it's possible, it turns out, to introduce what's called an adversarial perturbation that gives you this new image over here which to all of us looks the same. Um, like it looks like I've just sort of copied the same image twice, I haven't. Um, but a state of the art neural network, the same one that gets the other image correct with 88% confidence, gets this image wrong 
and with 99% confidence gives the label guacamole. And this is obviously wrong and obviously confusing because to us as humans, these two images are identical. But somehow what we've done is sufficient to completely change the confidence of the neural network to classify this as something completely incorrectly. And this is a little, you know, at first, the first reaction is maybe to say like, you know, cute, like you can turn cats into guacamole, like why should I really care? Uh, but it's not just this cat to guacamole transition you can do. You can do anything you want for any machine learning model you want. And so, for example, in, in 2017, some researchers showed that you can do this for stop signs. So you have a sign. You want to make sure that an autonomous car, when approaching an intersection, is not just going to go right through the intersection. Um, but you can sort of put these little like love, stop, hate things on stop signs. And, and now the cars recognize these as 45 mile an hour signs. And we'll sort of just approach an intersection and then speed up and keep going through. This is obviously bad. Um, now, in, in practice, I personally don't necessarily know that I think this is the biggest threat. Because if I wanted to attack a self-driving car, there are probably all sorts of other things I could do before I needed to attack the vision system of the, the self-driving component. You know, I can just cut down the sign if I wanted to. Um, but there are lots of other scenarios where we do need machine learning models to be robust. Um, so let me, let, me, let me give you one more example of this. Um, so, so this here is a, is a picture of, of Andrew Waltz, who last year was a congressional candidate in the United States um, running for office and was verified by Twitter. Uh, got the check mark and everything, which means that this is a real person. Twitter has done their homework and said, like, this is actually a person who's running for office. Uh, except it turns out, nope. Um, this is not a real person. Um, in fact, this picture doesn't even, um, this is not even a picture of a real person. Um, like this is just a picture taken directly uh, from this person does not exist.com where some 17 year old high school student um, sort of just went to that website, created a fake congressional candidate um, web um, Twitter account, created some other um, fake information and Twitter verified them. And so this is a problem because it means that you know, anyone could easily kind of do these, these attacks to make people think that anything like this is real. And so as a result, there's been a bunch of work that tries to say like, let's try and detect if these images are real or fake. Uh, like this looks visually very good to us. The, these GANs are now state of the art in this kind of task, but maybe we can detect that these things are kind of fake images. And so there's been some really good work at CVPR that takes these, these images, feeds them into a neural network, and then we'll say like, this is fake. Um, this might look good to a human, but like a neural network can now process this and say like, you know, there's something wrong about this. This is, this is a fake image. Except uh, the attacks I just showed earlier apply just as well to this or actually even better to this as they did to the previous images. And I can have this image here, which is detected as real. And so now not only am I going to make the thing go through the ver standard verification process, but if you run a, a classifier on it to ask, is this a real image? It's going to say yes. And this is going to give you some additional false sense of security, thinking that what you've done is correct. And in this, like, it's so brittle that what I've done, like the reason why it doesn't look like I'm really even changing the slide here, is I have flipped the lowest bit of 3% of the pixels in the image. So like, I haven't even flipped the lowest bit of all of the pixels, there's just, just a couple percent of them. And that was sufficient to fool the classifier in this setting. And so these classifiers really do um, focus on, on things that are completely brittle and allow us to fool them in essentially arbitrary ways. So um, that's sort of the setup. Um, the question then is how do we go about generating adversarial examples? Like what do we actually do in order to make these things exist? And for this, um, let me give you a little bit of visual intuition about what it is that we're doing here. Um, so I'm going to show you a plot, um, which is sort of which is going to be the decision boundary of a neural network. Well, what I'm showing here is in the center we're going to have some image of a dog. Um, this is a low resolution dog from the CIFAR training set or CIFAR testing set. Um, so it's 32 by 32 um, pixels wide. And what I'm going to do is as I move along the y-axis, I'm going to add noise of some kind of random amount, and I'll end up with this other version of a noisy dog. And then I'm going to do the same thing the other axis. 
I'm going to add a different amount of random noise, and I'm going to have another version of some noisy dog. And now every point in this space is going to be a linear combination of these two noisy directions. So in the upper right-hand corner, is going to be um, like sort of both of these noise added together. If I go down, it'll like subtract one of these noises. And now what I'm going to show you is what the decision boundary of the neural network looks like, where each region is going to be color-coded for its classification. So when I do that, I get this. And so what's, what, what we're seeing here is that this light blue region is correctly classified as dog. But if I go really far out to say this dark blue region here, I get these things that are classified as truck when I go far enough up and far enough to the right. And I'm not really going to call these adversarial examples because like, I've had to make a huge change to make these things become misclassified. Um, the dog on the left is already kind of low resolution, a little hard for us to see. These images on the right, if I didn't know that they were dogs initially, I don't know that I would have gotten it right um, to just being able to see these ones. And so what we see is that like we can, we can go far and eventually the model will change its mind and, and that makes sense. But at least if I were to like draw a little box locally, like it looks like everything that I'm doing here like is correct. Like everything around this initial point is classified the, the right way. And so I might think that this model is robust. And in some sense, like it's robust to adding this kind of noise. Uh, but the question that really matters is what I've done here is I've picked two random directions. Um, these images are much higher dimensional than that. Like images, these CIFAR 10 images are 32 times 32 times three is something like 3000 dimensions. And I've picked two of them to plot on this plot here. Um, but the question is like, what about any of the other dimensions that I could have picked to make these changes in? And it turns out um, that you can do much worse if you actually look at worst case dimensions. So before I do that though, let me just give you one more piece of visual intuition of what's going on here. And I'm going to take the same plot and I'm just gonna extend a third dimension to it. So this plot is showing just sort of what happens when on, on the surface, but just but doesn't show how the confidence changes over time. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce a third axis to this plot, a Z axis, which is going to correspond to the confidence of the neural network in the correct prediction. And so when I do, I get something that looks like this. And you'll notice sort of if, imagine you were sort of looking at the top, taking a picture top down, you would get the same plot as I have before, where there's this blue region in the middle that's all classified correctly. And then you have this green region around the outside and then there's a dark blue, blue region surrounding that. And sort of as you move away, the confidence of the neural network in the correct prediction fades and eventually you get misclassified as this green region and then this dark blue region. And this really is, is what's going on with neural network classification where we have these, these lost surfaces where you can pick a direction and move in that direction in order to make the loss become large uh, or make the confidence of the neural network become small. Okay, so this is again what happens when I pick these two directions randomly. And I just try and you know, add some kind of noise to these images to make, the, to make the model become misclassified. But as an adversary, I can do whatever I want, not just um, introduce uh, you know, random noise, I can pick worst case noise. And when I do that, I can get something that looks like this. Where on the y-axis, I've kept the y-axis the same. And again, you see that like, if you have to move up quite far, eventually the same amount of noise will get you to be misclassified. But if you move now in the x-axis, I've picked a worst case direction where moving essentially no distance at all becomes classified as airplane very, very quickly. And so the question is, like what's going on, like how is it that the model is able to, to do this, to make the classification um, change so quickly? And if I show you the same plot um, as before, what you see is that like on this side, everything looks fine and it looks like we're normal. But if we sort of rotate this image um, to look at the adversarial direction, really what's happening is that like, it's like we're falling off the face of this mountain and we really don't have to go very far at all. Like the classification really, really, really quickly changes um, to let us classify this 
um, as whatever other thing we want to be classified as. <clears throat> and that's really what's going on here, is that while in some random directions, these classifiers are robust to noise, in worst case directions that the adversary chooses, you don't have to move very far at all. And essentially all you have to do is pick a good direction by gradient descent and just walk down the face of this mountain by a couple steps. And now all of a sudden you have something which is an adversarial example, which has fooled the classifier. And this is a very easy thing for us to do and sort of has, has caused a bunch of problems in the community to try and prevent this. Okay, um, so this is the problem. Um, adversarial examples are very easy to find with these with, with this like very simple approach, just sort of walk down the, the gradient of this loss surface. Um, so, you know, let's try and defend against it. Um, and people have been trying to do this for a while. And so let me give you sort of, I'm not gonna tell you how the defenses work, but let me show you what happens when to this surface when lots of defenses operate on it. Um, instead of the loss surface looking something like something nice, like I showed you earlier, the loss surface ends up looking something like this. Um, where if I were to zoom in on maybe one of these pieces here, I get this really, really, really noisy function. And you can imagine that if you were gradient descent and you were located at some random point on the surface, and I said, like, tell me which direction is down, like which direction goes down the mountain. Like from this local picture, it's basically impossible to tell because maybe it's to the left, maybe it's to the right, you know, who knows? Um, and so if you were to run some attack locally that just tried to walk down the mountain, like it might go like sort of to the left once and then to the right, and then it would go sort of up and then down. And remember, this is just a two dimensional projection. So it can just sort of spin in place in 3000 dimensions, essentially just not making any progress because every time it takes a step, the next time it undoes all the progress it made the previous time around. But the important thing to note is that, you know, this image is like still visually very similar to this one. Like we haven't actually increased the robustness at a global level. Like you see that there's this blue region here which is classified correctly. And then if you go to the right, there's this green region that's classified incorrectly, that's not so far away. And so the basic question is like, has this actually improved robustness? And the answer here is basically no. And we're able to develop attacks that just take this really ugly function. And depending on how the defense works, you come up with a specialized way of smoothing the loss surface out to make it look like this smooth function. And then you can run the attack on the smooth function and then it will turn out that it's going to defeat the noisy function as well. And so this has been something that we've been doing for a while. Uh, and in particular, these, these figures that I've showed here are things that we've done um, several years ago now in, in 2018. Um, so the question, I guess, is that's forever ago machine learning time. Like machine learning time 2018 is like, you know, transformers barely existed. Um, and so you would expect that like in 2018, you know, we could do very little with some of these in some, in some tasks. Now we've have them basically solved. Like how has progress been in this machine learning space? And the answer is not very much. Um, so in December of, of last year, I wrote a paper with um, Florian and Wayland um, where we looked at a bunch of defenses. Um, we looked at 13 defenses that were accepted at ICR, ICLR, ICML, and NeurIPS, three of the top conferences of machine learning, published after the paper that I that just talked about where we, again, in that paper, broke a bunch of defenses from iClear. So like after we knew that a bunch of things were broken, we, we sort of took a two, a two year retrospective again and asked how things were going. And again, sort of same thing, essentially all of them were broken. Um, almost all of them we could reduce to essentially 0% accuracy. Some of them we could reduce to maybe 10% accuracy. So like random guessing, but almost all of them we could bring down to all the way to zero. And so this is bad because it means that we can still break almost everything. Um, but it gets a little bit worse um, um, because it's, well, it's true that this is not new that everything is broken. Um, what used to be the case is it used to be the case that there was some new defense idea. Um, so maybe for example, this is, I'll make the lost surface just become something that's, um, that's flat. 
And once I have this flat loss surface, um, now maybe I think that everything's secure. And then the adversary is going to say, well, you know, that's what happens with a flat loss surface, but you know, I can like make the loss surface not flat. And then some defense would come along and say, well, okay, fine, maybe I'll introduce another detection neural network. And now I'll run my detector and my classifier together. And if you go and try and do something to attack me, then my detector is going to catch you. And then I won't be classified as adversarial because I'll just reject the input. And then the attacker has to come up with something new and says, I don't know, the, maybe I'll fool the detector and the classifier simultaneously. And this process kind of repeats, you know, detector, maybe you know, some new defense, which does this noisy gradient thing. And then the attacker says, well, I can smooth the gradients out. And this, this went on for a while. Um, but the problem is that recently, um, um, you know, like, all right, so like, yeah, so there are a bunch of papers that sort of go along this space of like making sort of progress in, in, in useful ways. And like all of this is good because as long as we're learning something from how a defense breaks, I don't mind if the defense is broken. Like if, if a defense breaks and the, the attack teaches us something new about the world, like this is fine because like as a research community, we've learned something else. Um, the problem is that what recently has happened is that we have some new defense idea, this defense idea 95 or more realistically probably like 400. And like the attack is to just pick one of the existing attacks we already know and just reuse it. Uh, it's no longer the case that it's necessary to develop really new attack ideas in order to break these defenses. And this is where things become problematic um, because when you have defense papers that require new attacks, at least we learn something else about the world. Um, because for example, if a defense says I can detect adversarial examples and an attack breaks it, the only way that you can break it is you can say, it turns out that it's hard to construct an input um, that is you know, easy to detect as adversarial. And the thing that you thought separated adversarial examples from clean examples doesn't actually separate them as well as you thought. That's a new thing that we've learned. Um, and the attacks that you, that you teach, that, that you have to do to do this are some kind of new ideas with gradient descent and some new, some new ideas here. And so like we, we actually make progress, even though it looks like not, that we're not making any progress. It used to be the case that you know, we were learning new things. What I'm concerned about now is that for the most part, the, like we, we have a defense idea and then we break it by just taking some existing attack and applying it correctly. And we don't really learn many new things other than that this particular paper doesn't work. And there are an infinite number of papers you could write on defenses. So like eliminating one of them at a time isn't very helpful. And so what we need to be able to do is to be able to write papers with defenses that um, when they break, break in interesting ways. And currently it's not the case. And I should say that <clears throat> it's not just me that's sort of making this argument that that nothing new came out of these attacks. Um, when we submitted our attack paper um, to ICML, um, reviewer three, um, always sort of the most helpful reviewer, uh, said, you know, uh, that the attacks that we use already exist in the literature, citing one, two, three, four, which are essentially like four of the only attacks you ever need. Um, hence, um, the techniques are not novel, and therefore they don't want to accept the paper. And so like, this is really something that um, is a problem because if, if when something breaks, it's so easy to attack it that the attack paper gets rejected for not being novel, um, then yeah, we're, we're starting to get to the point where we have a problem. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in particular, um, the reason why it is that we think that these things are, are easy to attack like this is somewhat, I, I would argue methodological where when you're constructing an evaluation, what you need to be able to do is to be able to, to show, to, to try and break the defense that, that you're constructing. Um, and so for example, what one paper did is in order to break the defense that it constructed, um, it said, well, okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is I have this um, fool the classifier term. Now, this is the term that every paper is going to have. Um, you just want to increase the loss. Um, you want, like you want to, make sure that you increase the loss of the classifier on the adversarial example, which is like the standard thing. You want to make sure that the input is misclassified so you have some term that corresponds directly to that. 
And then this paper had a couple of other defense terms. Exactly what they are is important. Um, the equations here don't really matter, but they had some fancy term here, which is to detect their C1 detector. They had some other fancy term here, which is another loss function that's going to detect their C2 detector. And then they have some third one over here, which is going to detect their C3 detector. And so now you have four different things that you're going to try and minimize. And it sort of just says like, okay, I'm going to add them all together. And then this is going to be my final loss term L star. And like, it's true that if you could minimize this function L star, then this would give you an adversarial example. The problem is that minimizing this function, like if I were to tell you like, please minimize this, um, it's like, how would you ever go about doing this? Because like, it's just kind of crazy that gradient descent works on neural networks in the first place. They're incredibly non-convex. And somehow we still are able to minimize them with essentially convex optimization tools. And so we're, here we're taking something that's already maybe a little hard to optimize with neural networks. And now we're like, we're putting on, you know, um, this over here, which is an expectation over a bunch of different random amounts of noise. We have a second expectation over a bunch of different random noise. Um, we have this term here, which is completely non-differentiable. It has to be approximated as well as this term, which is completely non-differentiable. It has to be approximated. And, you know, just for good measure, we're going to throw in a hyperparameter here that we have to tune. And so like, this is what like attack evaluation papers really have to end up doing today. And you can imagine that among all of these 12 moving parts, if you get any one of them wrong, then the attack is going to fail. And the attack failing is indistinguishable from the defense being robust. And so as far as the like incentives of the defense offer, if the attack fails, there's no incentive to try and really make it work. Because if as a defense author, you do your evaluation and, it, and you break your own thing, then at best, your paper is not, not, no longer going to, be, going to be accepted. Because the perverse incentives in academia where you don't get to publish negative results. And so even though I think that it'd be better if people publish their own, their own breaks, um, if you succeeded, then, then you wouldn't get a paper out of it. And so um, as soon as the attack fails, most papers stop there and say, the attack has not succeeded, and therefore this is robust. And so what we do is we, we take defense evaluations like this, and, and we are able to break this one to 0% accuracy. And the reason how we do it is we, we like throw away like all of the things um, that are complicated. And we like literally just ignore all of that. We take the one term that matters, which is fool the classifier. Like this is what you want to do. You want to fool the classifier. All the other stuff is helpful for fooling the classifier along the way, but like this is the only one that really matters. And we only optimize this one thing. And we optimize this one term as well as we can, being very, very careful in every single step we take and this lets us distinguish the case when the attack has failed from the defense being actually robust. And we find that if we do this one thing just exactly correctly, then we're able to, to break this defense and 13 other ones like it. And so at the end of it, like really it comes down to being sort of very diligent and careful in, in doing these kinds of evaluations. Um, okay. So this is sort of a little bit of um, a negative run that I've been on here. So let me at least go positive for a second and tell you about some other work that, um, that, that is a little bit, that does kind of work. Um, so the first of these is adversarial training. Um, and this is something that people have been talking about for a while, um, initially in, in Ian's, one of Ian's initial papers on adversarial examples. And um, then in Alexander and his team's paper on, on uh, that was at iClear in 2018. Uh, and let me just mention how it works, just because it's good to know that there's at least a couple of cases of, the, of things where, where these things work well. Um, and the way adversarial training works is essentially the, the standard way uh, that you would imagine. So let, let's imagine we had normal training where like I have labeled uh, MNIST images, a labeled seven and a label three. I feed them into my training algorithm and then I get out some neural network. What adversarial training is gonna do is it says the first step I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate adversarial examples. So for each, so I'm gonna feed my image of a seven and my label seven into the attack. I'm going to get out some noisy version of the adversarial. I'm going to feed my image of a three and label three, get out some noisy version of the three. I'm going to copy these over into the training data set. I'm going to label them seven and three. 
And then I'm going to train again. I'm going to train on the original version. I'm going to train on the original version. I'm going to train on the adversarial version. I'm going to train on the adversarial version. I get another neural network out. And then I will repeat this process. And I'll generate episode examples. And then I'll train on them. And I'll generate episode examples. And I'll train on them. And I'll generate episode examples and repeat this until eventually the thing converges. And what I get out of this is a classifier that works about half the time. The robustness is not going to be perfect. Like MNIST classification, you can do to something like 99% accuracy. Uh, if you do this episode training kind of thing, you'll get maybe actually on MNIST something like 90% accuracy. Uh, still 10 times higher error rate, but at least it's doing something interesting. And so if the standard neural network had a loss surface that looks something like this, and like the one that introduced just a whole bunch of noise to the loss surface looks something like this, then when you do adversarial training, you get a function that looks very, very different. It looks something like this. And the thing I like about this is that it's a really, really smooth loss surface. And so I'd be willing to believe that we're actually robust. And it's not like it's fooled the, class, fooled the attack algorithm somehow. And importantly, like we can find, like we can see that there exists a direction that does eventually make us become misclassified. Like we do change from this blue region to this green region, but the distance is quite far away compared to what we can do with standard classifiers that are not robust. And this really is sort of one of the main success stories we've had in machine learning um, in this adversarial machine learning space is adversarial training. And the reason why we can do this so well is because essentially it relies on the fact that attacks are good and we just train against the attacks that we care about. Uh, but this is kind of the main limitation is in order for adversarial training to work, <clears throat> we need to specify ahead of time that the, type, the kinds of attacks that we care about. And if you switch from an L2 attack to an L infinity attack, which operates under a different kind of perturbation model, then uh, now all of a sudden adversarial training no longer works nearly as well. And this is just currently where we are and research is trying to improve adversarial training and all of this kind of work is very nice. Um, but the reason why we still have all these other defenses being proposed is because adversarial training is not yet a perfect solution. It's very good, uh, but we'd still ideally like something to do more. Um, one other area where we've seen some success is in certified defenses. Where these are defenses which don't have some kind of empirical argument of hey, here's why we think this works. Instead, what it does is some people sit down and they think very hard and they write down a proof. And they say, for this neural network, I can prove to you that I have some accuracy. And there are a bunch of different papers that do this, so I'm, I'm not going to cover those. This is sort of a talk all by itself. Um, but what you can write down is a proof that says, if you introduce a perturbation of 1.5, whatever 1.5 means, um, then I guarantee you your robustness is at, late, is at least 30%. And as long as my proof is mathematically correct, like no attacker could ever get better than this no matter how hard they tried. And this is a really nice thing to be able to say because it means that we don't have to worry about like some kind of regression where at some point someone does a better attack and they're able to break this. Like it means under these threat models, like this thing is always going to work well. Uh, and that's good. But the problem is that these numbers are, you know, kind of low. And again, we have this problem where this works for one threat model and one threat model only. So this might work if the adversary is allowed to make you know, a small amount of change to every pixel, but won't work if the adversary can flip a couple of pixels and ha has a different attack model. So we still have these kinds of problems, but at least we can have some guaranteed robustness results. Um, okay. So um, this is kind of the state of the world in defenses right now. Um, where most things that aren't adversarial training or certified are broken, but we have these two kinds of successes where things um, are starting to work a little bit. Um, but <clears throat> like ideally we'd like things to be very robust. So there's this question like what, what is happening next? What are we going, where's, where are things going? Um, because you know, it like kind of looks a little depressing when we see all of these attacks coming out all the time. Um, and you could ask like, is this how things are always going to be forever? Um, or are things going to eventually improve? Um, and so for this, I think it's kind of nice um, to think to an analogy of, of crypto in you know, 1997, um, where there was a very similar space in the world. 
um, people were trying to come up with with robust block ciphers. And within in like in one year in 1997, um, my actually former advisor at Berkeley, Dave Wagner, and a bunch of others wrote a series of papers just sort of taking everything apart and saying like all of these things that are block ciphers that you thought were secure are not. And everything seemed to be very bad and easy to break. And like the world looked very similar then, like, like the machine learning space does now, where just, you know, you sit down and you think for a couple hours and you can break a defense and then you get to write a really short paper. And so the question, um, you know, is like, if we come back to today, like how are we doing in crypto? And basically today, like things work. Like AES, which is the current um, best block cipher we have, uh, hasn't been, been broken in the last 20 years. And like the best attack on it hasn't improved in, in the last 10 years. And so like we can see, we can look at crypto maybe as like a success story um, where we can actually say that um, we were in a time when everything was bad and now things are good. And like, maybe this means that in machine learning time, we just need to do what we keep doing for 10 more years in the space of adversarial machine learning and eventually we'll solve this problem too. Um, so yes, so there's a, the, the, the question is like, does this analogy hold? Like, can we make this analogy that we're somehow crypto in the nineties and we just need to do 10 more years of progress? And unfortunately, I think the answer there is no. Um, and I think there are three reasons why we're not um, yet at this point in space. The first reason um, is that if you remember this plot that I showed you earlier of certified robustness, like it's good that we have a proof here, but what this actually means, <clears throat> if you were to look at things um, is like, let's imagine, you know, what attack success rates mean in security. Um, and this is something I'm taking from Dave Evans keynote a couple of years ago that I really liked. Um, so in crypto, what attack success rates mean, like if something succeeds, like the standard attack should only succeed in two to the minus 128. This is like what brute force is going to give you and is not considered a break. Like if you have something two to the minus 128, then it's secure. But like, if you can reduce this to like two to the minus 127, then like it's seen as a broken crypto system. Like, you know, just throw it out, start again, probably from scratch with a new, a completely new design challenge to come up with something new. Uh, like this is what was done with, with Dez. This is what was done uh, with SHA-1. Um, and, you know, it, because eventually the idea is if you can bring it from 2 to the 128 to 2 to the minus 127, which are like ridiculously small attack success numbers, but if you could do this, then why should I believe that I can't bring it to 2 to the minus 126 or 2 to the minus 60, which at this point becomes practical. Okay, so this is crypto. They like care a lot about these kinds of things. In system security, <clears throat> we might say um, things, are, things work if they're like two to the minus 32. Um, a stack canary, for example, is going to have roughly this amount of security, uh, which is gonna prevent some kind of control flow exploits. And it's broken if we're, I don't know, two to the minus 20, where like if you succeed one in a million times, then maybe now in the system security community, you'd call something broken. And if you compare these numbers, like this is still like a very small number, but like in machine learning, when a defense works, like the best defenses we have, when they work, they work at two to the minus one, which is like 50% probability. This is what we mean in machine learning when we say something is secure. Like, and when we say something is broken, we mean the success rate is two to the zero. Like we only call something broken if the attacker can succeed 100% of the time. And if you think about this, like, this whole setup is kind of ridiculous because as an adversary, if something works half of the time, then I generate two images of, that are adversarial and one of them is gonna fool your classifier. And I, I don't really need the system to be, I don't really need, need any break to break it to 100% probability because I can just generate, I can find two images, attack both of them and one of them is going to work on average. Or if I really wanna be sure I'll generate five. Now I'm essentially guaranteed that one of them is gonna fool the system. And so this is really the problem with like where we are now, where, where in crypto, at least they had these kinds of really lofty goals. We, we have very weak goals and we, we can't even achieve those yet. Um, 
but that's not even the entire problem. The other part of the problem is that um, let's like actually look at what it means where with this plot. And what I'm showing you, like, like previously I showed like distortion went from zero to four, which like four is a, is a number, but like there's some meaning associated with it, which like how the images actually look. And when you look at this, what you find is that these two images still look visually identical when they have distortion four. And so while it's good that we can get at least 10% accuracy on these distortion four images, like we'd actually like them to be like 99% accuracy still because these two images look the same to us. But even still, like we don't only just want distortion four, we would like like distortion a hundred. And so on the X axis, we have maybe a factor of 25 that we'd like to increase the amount of distortion we can introduce. And on the Y axis, we'd like to be able to increase the distortion um, or the, the accuracy by, I don't know, a factor of 50. And so we really are like three orders of magnitude from being able to have something that works most of the time in for most noisy images. Um, but it still gets even worse because this image here, if I take this original image of a cat and I introduce this noisy version of the cat, like all of us see this as a cat. Um, and what I'm measuring here is L2 distortion. This is like Euclidean distance in pixel space. And I might say, that like I should expect classifiers to get this image right because I as a human can get it right. I, I know this is a tabby cat and it's really, really easy to do this. The problem is that like this, this distance metric of L2 distortion, which is what a lot of the community uses, is a pretty terrible distance metric because this image here also has a fairly high distortion. And so while it's true that we can like get some robustness at some small numbers, like we can't just increase the distortion bounds arbitrarily because eventually we'll run into problems like this where the distortion bounds just stop meaning anything because I can just remove most of the image and get the same distortion numbers. And so like not only are we not robust under these distortion values, we can't just keep scaling them arbitrarily because they'll just stop being meaningful in a little while. And so the thing that sort of I like to say is that we're like crypto pre-Shannon. Where like in the 1940s, like before the 1940s, people did crypto. Uh, well, what they did is they sort of wrote down something they thought was clever and they said that this is secure without really any, any arguments about sort of why that we should believe this. And then in the 1940s, Shannon came along and said like, here's information theory for all of you. Here's what security actually means with some real definitions. Um, I think that we're in the space of machine learning right now um, where we're trying to secure things, but we don't actually have any good definitions of what security we want. And so it's very hard to think that I think that we're going to actually solve the problem anytime soon. Um, I think we really have a long way to go in this space in order to have some first some good definitions and, and then maybe we'll be able to start trying to solve them better. But we're making progress, but it's just not um, not entirely clear that it's going to be something that like just needs a little bit more work. I think it needs quite a lot more work. Um, and sort of to maybe to give the last point to this about why I think that these that we're not currently there um, is it's not just these kinds of adversarial shifts that machine learning classifiers have trouble on. Where, um, you know, so there's this nice paper from a couple of years ago, do ImageNet classifiers generalize to ImageNet, um, where what they do is they, they just construct a new ImageNet test set. Um, the ImageNet test set was constructed in, at, at, um, at one point in time, they just construct another one following the same process identically. Um, this is, you know, um, Ben Rex group. Um, if there's like one person in machine learning I trust to do like to, to do rigorous science, it's, it's like Ben Rex group. Um, so like they really did everything that they could think of to make this be an identical image to test set. Um, I don't have time to cover all the things they did, but just like trust me on the fact that this this test set is as identical as possible as you can as you can get to the original image to test set. And when they do, um, what they find is like. Well, so what I'm showing here is a plot where on the x-axis, I have a bunch of models that are being evaluated. On the x-axis, I'm plotting um, their accuracy on the, on the original ImageNet test set. And on the y-axis, this is their new test set, the ImageNet v2 test set. And what you find is like all classifiers drop by like 10 percentage points in accuracy. Um, where what they're like, and this is on a test set that was designed to be as similar as possible to the original image of the test set. Like they really tried to make it similar and, they, and you still have this 10 percentage point accuracy drop. 
And so the, the question here is like, if we can't be robust to even the most possible benign distribution shifts, where, so, where like the authors have gone out of their way to make it similar, like why should I believe that we should be able to be robust in settings where there's an adversary actively working the other way to fool the system? And for the record, like humans are way up here on this distribution where like humans actually um, do better than, than state of the classifiers on, on the original set, test set, but like even they sort of just fall on the line where they do just as well in the two test sets. So like in standard settings, humans do very well, but machine learning classifiers in these, these just very, very easy distributions sort of fall down a little bit. And if you put in an adversarial distribution, just fall all the way to zero. Okay, so brief conclusion then. Um, you know, I think that we've come a long way towards understanding what adversarial robustness is and what we want it to mean. But I still think we have quite a long way to go to be able to actually have some kind of robust classifiers that are trustworthy enough to be able to actually use in production environments where, where human lives are on the line with, with aut autonomous driving, or we want to make sure that we believe in their outputs in medical imaging or any of these settings where like it actually matters to trust the classifier, I really do think we have quite a long ways to go. Um, so with this, um, thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the wonderful, inspiring talk. Um, I, have, I have a question which I would like to ask. So when, sure. when, when, when seeing like the difference between human processing and processing in neural networks, like, does it have something to do that like in neural networks, we are only doing bottom up processing, which means that we only like take the pixels and then try to derive a classification result from it. Whereas humans um, have also some top down mechanisms to interpret what you see. So you, you don't see what you see, but you, you have some mechanism, some reasoning, some, some interpretation, which kind of sets you some boundaries of what you get on, on, your, on your retina. So you have some kind of controlling mechanisms, uh, which is top down. Do you think we need something like this in, in machine learning and would it solve the problem? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, no, okay. This is a good, um, a good point where like there, there are lots of things that people like to point at that humans do differently. Um, this is one of them where it's definitely true that like we don't just like we can spend longer on harder images. Like we can think about it. We, we have context. We can say like, I know like this is not just like an abstract car. Like I know what cars mean. Like I can understand like where, the, where this is in the scene. I can sort of apply all this all other knowledge I have about the world. Um, and not only this, but also um, like, yeah, we can do it, yeah, all, all this kind of logical reasoning that you're mentioning here. And I think that this, this is good. This would be an important part of a solution, but I don't think it would solve everything entirely. Um, and so the reason why is that there are lots of tasks that are hard where like, humans aren't the ground truth. So like for images, humans, like are, the definition of what a label is, is whatever the human says the label is. Like if a human says, this is an image of a car, like that's a car. Like, but there are other classification tasks. Like the one, the one I like is malware classification where the, um, the label, like, is this program malicious is not defined by, you know, does the person think it's going to eventually be malicious? The label is like, does the thing eventually encrypt your hard drive and try and make you send them Bitcoin? Like that's the thing of like, is it malicious? Like, does it eventually do some malicious behavior? Um, mm -hmm. And, or like there are other similar th things like you could do in the medical domain. Like, mm -hmm. does this person eventually die? Like, this is the thing that is true. doesn't matter if the doctor thought they were going to die five years ago. Like if they, mm -hmm. if, if like they eventually die, then like probably like they had some disease that like was unforeseen. And even in these settings, classifiers are not robust. Mm -hmm. With the best classifiers we have, you can fool them in these ways. And so the classifier, like being more human in this way, isn't going to solve the problem because humans don't do well in the first place. 
I see, I see, I see. And so I think it would be good to be more human, uh, but but it, I don't think it's going to solve everything. I see. Okay. So we have some questions uh, in the Q and A. So I will start with one. So can we train? Can we use kind of pre-training components to remove or smooth adversarial knots before running the classifier? Do you think this would help? Yeah, so this is one of the things that, um, so I didn't mention how a bunch of the defenses worked um, just for time, but this is one of the most common ways to do this is you do JPEG compression or you do project onto the manifold of a GAN or you do some kind of other Gaussian blur. And the problem is that none of these have worked so far, um, where it turns out you just invert whatever pre-training function you're going to do, or pre-processing function you're going to do, you send an input, um, through and then you sort of back propagate through that and now it's just like as if it's part of the neural network mm -hmm. and there's no reason like if, if I can differentiate through through the first the second half now I can differentiate through all of it and now I fool the classifier this way and it basically mm -hmm. works mm -hmm. and the, the question I mean you this is nice uh, visualization that there is this uh, confidence course or uncertainty and uh, can we use this as a like if we can, if we are able to as assess like confidence? Can we just discard the predictions with low confidence? Yeah, uh, no. This is also another good another good thing. Like there are, there are papers that do this. Um, but yeah, the problem is um, again like like sort of going back to one of the first images I showed, where I can make adversarial examples that have higher confidence in the wrong answer than the original model had in the right answer. Okay, <laughs> and so this is like. So you'd have to set the confidence so high that you would discard all normal inputs. And I at this point, it's no longer a useful classifier. <laughs> okay. Uh, another good one. Like, is there a trait of between robustness and and, and and accuracy? Yeah. No. Okay. This is a, a sort of a, this is a very this is a whole line of work that looks at this robustness accuracy trade off, and and there is um, where more robust classifiers are less accurate on clean data. Um, and this is another problem, just a whole other problem I didn't get into. Because let's imagine that I was deploying a self-driving car and I wanted it to be as good as possible. And I had two possible options. I have my self-driving car that crashes one in a million miles um, in, in, like in, in standard settings. Or I have another car that crashes one in 100,000 miles, but is adversarially robust. Like, which one should I do? Well, probably. Like it's kind of a shame to say it, but probably you should deploy the one that's robust one in a million miles and not adversarially robust. Because if enough people drive that the one which is 10 times more robust is going to cause fewer deaths because it's not going to crash when there happens to be snow or glare from the sun because like most people aren't malicious and the people who really wanted to cause the cars to crash. Like if there, if there are any of these people, like we have, we have a, a whole system in place of government so that we can prosecute them and put them in jail. Like, mm. is it, I don't think it would be worth trading off killing thousands of people because cars aren't sufficiently robust to natural distribution shifts that we make it so that they're robust to like the one person in a hundred thousand who decides that they want to be malicious. Because if they really wanted to be malicious, like, you know, they, you know, put like debris in the middle of the road or they'd you know, get in their own car and crash into you and there's very little you can do in these settings. Yes, um, yeah. And so, yeah, this accuracy robustness trade-off is an incredibly important thing and it's, it's entirely domain specific what you want. Like the military probably has a completely different view of this. Like mm -hmm. if, there was, if the military wanted to have something where they would like deploying in war settings, like probably robustness is everything for that. Mm -hmm. But like for most things that I think we want to care about, um, then we're fine. Like, and so the, the other thing I think of is, is like medical imaging. Like there, there is a, there is, exists a line of work of adversarial attacks on like cancer detectors. I don't really believe in this kind of thing. Like if I was a security, if I was an attacker, like there are many things that I might want to do, but like fool your cancer detector into thinking you don't have cancer is pretty low down that list. Yes. Like of like practical things that I would want to do. Like this, that would be like a really cruel person who's like, whose attack objective is like not exploit you for money, but like make you think that you do or don't have cancer. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't really believe this is a valid attack. And like, I would rather have a system that's more accurate at detecting cancer and might be adversarially not robust. But um, yeah, no, for, for right now there is this trade-off. 
and there might this might not be inevitable but there's some theory to suggest it is but yeah no, i like i like this question yeah that's a good point if you are nasa maybe if you fly moon or to mars you want to be very robust because if your system breaks and uh, yeah you cannot do anything about it so one one question which i also find quite interesting like can explanation explainability can it help to make to defend against adversary attacks or to make uh yeah this is another good um yeah so similar um similar thing there is a paper at least a couple of papers that adversarially that that explainability is not adversarially robust so i can take a classifier and that that gives explanations and i can generate an adversarial input which makes the explanation be whatever i want so i can take an image of a cat and i can say i want the explanation to be dog and i want the reason to be because of the cat's pointy ears and it will do that for me and so they don't they don't work for this reason um, there's a whole another question of is explanation actually doing explanation or is it just trying to like lie to humans in the best possible way um, Bean Kim has a bunch of work that says, you know, maybe it's actually just like not even doing explanation in the first place, which I like. Um, but that's just sort of a separate, a separate question. Yes, yes, yes. This is a discussion where I, I could also like say uh, something, but maybe maybe it's 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 for another another session. Another. Yes. <laughs> okay. So what else do we have? Uh... So what is one of the most future promising defense mechanisms that you see has the potential to be a game changer changer is it like adversary training or yeah no, this is a good question i don't know okay so the ideal defense in my mind would be one that says that doesn't say we want to solve adversarial robustness but be one that says this is a better way of doing classification and it's better because of i don't know something else like it like the, and then it says like you know section 13 in the paper and by the way it also helps on episode examples because like i kind of see episode examples as a symptom to some underlying problem and it would be nice like i don't exactly know what this problem is but it'd be nice if we could sort of solve the underlying problem and not like focus on the episode example part of it so for example, the last plot that I showed that was looking at this natural distribution shift problem, um, the very recent work by OpenAI that produced CLIP, that um, is this um, contrastive learning on images and text, where they trained on lots and lots of images sort of scraped from the internet, um, was, was they wrote this paper in, in order to say like, what if we do contrastive learning on noisy data? And then they have like, you know, section eight or something by the way, it also improves accuracy on ImageNet v2. It does a lot better, um, sort of much better than anything else has ever done before. And this is the kind of thing that I like to see, because it's not the case that they sort of went out and said, we're going to try and solve this one small problem of robustness to ImageNet v2 distribution shift. Because like in practice, who cares about ImageNet v2 distribution shift? There are a million others. Um, but they do better, but they show that they can do better on this one by doing something else, which is nice, which is contrastive learning on, on noisy data. And it would be nice, like I could hope that a, that a good defense would do something like this in the space of episode examples. Uh, I don't know of any that fit this mold for me, but maybe one might exist in the future and that would be nice if it did. Mm -hmm. And do, do, do you think, I mean, it seems that the problem uh, is linked to like high dimensionality of, of the input. Uh, and I, I wonder if if all, if it's also like linked to the way we train your network. So we, we we use it as discriminators and not like a generative model which understands kind of concepts and which tries to like builds up for, from 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 that. Do, do you think if you implement if we move towards more like a generative? A view and generative methods, we will get rid of many of these problems, or is it like really linked to high dimensionality and we we are kind of lost with, with, with that? Yeah, so there are there's like a whole other line of work that talks about like why adversarial examples exist. 
Um, so one of the, the theories, so like there are a couple sort of leading theories. One of them is this high dimensional data question where, so Justin Gilmer has a line of work that um, basically says, if your classifier makes mistakes, like if it, if it has any test error, then by definition, there will exist a test error that is closest. And that closest test error, it turns out like in high dimensions is going to be very close um, just because of how high dimensions works and how spheres and high dimensions are confusing. Um, turns out that if, even if your model has like error, like, you know, one in a thousand, like the nearest error is going to be very, very close sort of necessarily because of high dimensional spheres. And so as a result, you should expect that episodal examples exist because of this. Um, so yeah, I do think that high, that high dimensional data at least contributes has to contribute part of this. Um, but like there are also papers that, that say that, you know, even in not necessarily insane numbers of dimensions, um, the data that we have might also encourage adversarial examples to exist. Uh, where there's this nice paper by Alexander Madry's group that shows that um, like existing class, existing machine learning classifiers in some point part um, can take advantage of features that really are good features, but are not terribly insightful for as far as humans go, where like are these kind of low level detail features that, that help the accuracy of the classifier, but aren't robust. And because of like any algorithm that learns to use these features is just not going to be a robust algorithm. And maybe this points to why the accuracy trade-off is inevitable is maybe we're prevent when we have a robust classifier, just can't use these non-robust features. Um, but yeah, no, I think this is an interesting question. And this is yeah, again, a, a very different line of work. To get to a question about generative classifiers, um, there have been some attempts at using GANs to do classification um, to increase the robustness. It, part, it doesn't all the way work. And part of the problem is that it's really hard to evaluate them and to know if they're actually effective because it's very hard to differentiate through like multiple rounds of GAN image generation. And so it's much harder for these to disentangle robustness with difficulty to, to attack. Um, for the ones that we know that we've analyzed thoroughly, they haven't worked well, but I don't think this necessarily implies that all are not going to work well. Mm -hmm. And, and, and another question about this certified robustness. Do, do, is it like is it like practical? I mean, it, do people like use it for for large neural networks and for like image net type of data sets? Or is it something like you can only do for toy models or very small uh, yeah. models? Okay, so, so it used to be the case that it only works for toy models. Um, the figure that I showed was actually for image net scale models. Um, so the way that these current state-of-the-art approaches work is, um, okay, maybe I shouldn't get into too, into too much detail there. Uh, the current state-of-the-art approaches do scale to image net sized models. And this is really what makes them so exciting is that um, unlike, you know, like they're not based on like mixed integer linear programming verification for the most part. Those ones only work at fairly small scale, but the current state-of-the-art, which um, are these randomized smoothing pixel DP kind of approaches, um, actually work at large scale. I mean, again, actually work caveated with all the things I said, but like the approach is applied to ImageNet and has non-trivial robustness guarantees at, at on, on ImageNet models, which is like kind of surprising that it's possible. When I first started, like I didn't see this the certified robustness going anywhere, but, but these are doing very well and I, I like them a lot. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, I think I have a last, last one for you. I think you already like mentioned uh, this direction as being like very, yeah, very important. Uh, so the one, one question is about uh, like risks. That maybe we shouldn't just look at the worst case, uh, like that we want to defend hundred hundred percent, but we should take risk view. So like multiply the probability that something can happen with the, with the costs that it, 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 it leads to. And we should try to find solutions, robust solutions for which kind of op, like which uh, opt, op, optimize on, on, on these values and not and instead of trying to prevent all the attacks at all at all costs. So would you ag agree with, with that? Yes. Um, yeah, I guess this is sort of gets to the point that um, I was 
you know, talking about a few minutes ago with um, in many settings, it, like I would prefer to reduce the clean error rate than reduce the adversarial error rate. Um, and the trade-off may not be worth it. And I completely, like it's entirely a question of how likely is an attack to happen and what's the harm if it does. Like if, if an error is made and someone dies, then all the more reason to make the thing truly robust. But if the probability of, of like an actual adversary wanting to do this is, you know, essentially zero, but if you make an error in like any benign setting and like this is a result of like, you know, doing self-driving cars, then like, you know, you really have to like, if you're going to convince some self-driving car company to make an adversarially robust self-driving like vision system, you'll really have to make convince them that you're not going to kill more people because of just random errors. Um, and so, yeah, you definitely have to make this, this trade-off on a case-by-case -case basis um, where like, uh, I, it, like if I could sort of pick a point in space, like I, ideally I would say like, we should have a perfect classifier and perfectly robust, <laughs> but like that's, we can't do this. And um, so it's gonna be a, a really hard sell to lots of people to increase the episode robustness without increasing, um, like while also decreasing the clean accuracy. And so, uh, yes, like it's unfortunate. And um, as long as this is the case, it's, it's gonna be hard to have a good reason to do episode robustness in, in, in any setting except those that are inherently adversarial, like malware or, you know, there's some nice work on ad blocking where like, like anything where there actually is an adversary in the loop, um, that spam, these kinds of settings, where like there actually is an adversary there where like, where by definition, your clean accuracy is equal to your adversarial accuracy. Um, these are great things to do, but like in, in, in settings where, where you're mostly talking about natural noise and you also want to be robust to the occasional adversary, I completely agree. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, so thank you very much. It was really inspiring uh, discussion and all like also a great talk. I learned a lot, so thank you. And uh, yeah, I ho hope to see you at some some point in the near future at one of the conferences. I, I really miss miss it to to not being able to travel nowadays. But no, it was, it was uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, and you know it was a lot of fun. And uh, similarly, like I, I think we're sort of at the point where it's going to happen soon. Uh, yes. Okay, then have a good one. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Wojciech, and a big thanks also to Nicholas, our speaker. And I think with that, we've reached the end of our webinar. A big thank you to everyone. Uh, Nicholas, our, our speaker today, Wojciech, the host, um, you, our participants, uh, our sponsors, partners, and co conveners Switzerland.